Well, good evening and welcome to uh, New Joy Church, our midweek Wednesday night service where Michelle and I have been live streaming on Facebook and then uh, later on we actually do post it to uh, YouTube, but right now where our live streaming is just going straight uh, to Facebook, so I'm glad you're joining us tonight. We're getting to the end of chapter 29 of Proverbs. Man, what a powerful chapter this has been. And tonight, there's going to be some straightforward talk. Tonight, you're going to look at yourself just like I had to look at myself with these verses and take some, uh, make some changes, make some hard decisions, be honest and truthful with the Word and with yourself. So with that, I'm thankful that my wife, Sister Michelle, is here to teach and to preach together, and this has really been a, a blessing. So join us as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the spirit who illuminates your word. So, Lord, tonight, give us words to say that will be encouraging, correcting, and helpful to everyone that's watching. And we will always give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's get to it because this is some good stuff. I am going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. And we're at verse 18. So here we go. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. So there's two parts of this verse that we need to look at. First, we need to look at people who do not accept divine guidance. What is divine guidance? Very simply put, it is the guidance that comes through the Word of God first. Through the Word of God first and foremost. Yes, the Spirit will speak to you. Yes, the Spirit will lead you and guide you. But if you're not familiar with the Word, you're not going to recognize the Spirit. Did you hear what I said? And if you're not going to follow the Word, you're going to let your life run wild. You're going to do whatever you want. Because every single person, whether you want... Whether you agree with me or not is not the issue. But every person has a sinful nature. We don't have to think about sinning, but we sure do have to think about being right and doing right. See, but so we accept the, the, the word of the Lord. Here's the funny thing of, about me. I don't know if that happened to any of you all, but before I gave my life to Christ, I mean, really got serious with Jesus. I thought I was a good guy. I thought I was a good guy, and I thought I wasn't messing up. I thought I wasn't doing bad stuff. But as soon as I opened my eyes and my heart to the Word of God, I had to stop and say, Man, David, you messed up. You are, you're not the nice guy that I thought you were. You know, I was catching myself lying to uh, supervisors at work and, and doing other stuff and getting caught in my lies. You know, so really, honestly, I had to, to accept the divine guidance that was coming to me through God's word, and it made a difference. It stopped me from going crazy. It stopped me from running wild. Now, uh, being when we were young, I saw a lot of friends running wild. I saw a lot of guys and, and girls that were not con staying under control of their lives and really ruining their lives in, in a way, sometimes really messing their lives up. Be but they weren't turning to the Bible. They weren't turning to God. And uh, a lot of us guys got saved at the same time, and it was really pretty cool to see. But the reality is this. I didn't realize. I thought I had to have a good time. I thought going out there and being crazy and doing things that I shouldn't have been doing was the way to have fun. But according to this verse, it's not that fun. Let me ask you something. Okay, let me ask you all. Saturday night, go party. Saturday night, drink, get high, whatever. Did you have fun? Let me ask you a question. Was it fun Sunday morning? <laughs> was it fun Sunday morning when you was hangover? And was it fun Sunday morning when you were sick, sicker than a dog, we used to say? <laughs> Come on now. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. I found out something. I found out something, that you can have fun without alcohol. You can have fun without drugs. Now, I, I have to honestly say, I never bought drugs. I just smoked my friend's drugs. <laughs> but Okay, don't tell, don't tell the children. Don't tell our daughters and our grandchildren. But here's the thing. When I found out 
that I could have fun without that stuff. When I found out the joy of the Lord was a way to have a good, good time, it really changed things. You know, I can honestly say that I don't need to be high to be happy. Are you hearing what the Spirit's trying to say? I don't need extra uh, avenues of, 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 of stimulus, if you will, stimuli or whatever the, the word is. Man, I, I have genuine joy. You know what I have? I'm on a natural high. <laughs> That's right. Jesus gives me a natural high, and there ain't no hangover. And the Holy Ghost party just don't stop. <laughs> Amen. You got something? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I remember you drinking your Miller's Highlight <laughs> on the weekends. Yeah. And yeah. he was playing in all these different bands. Yeah. And I, I hated it because the girls out there were ready to sleep with anybody, any guy that would would let them, you know. And mm -hmm. it was, to me, I enjoyed the music, but the outcome of, I, I knew the guys in the band and their wives, and they didn't bring their wives as much as um, I went with Dave and my comadre. Greg used to go with her husband, with my compa, Tomas. So we were always together, but yeah. to see the other men flirting with the women, that just really made me mad. I, were, you know, I wanted to get in the flesh and start kicking butt, but then I said, what for? <laughs> you know, um, they're the ones that are, you know, it's not, they're not innocent. They were accepting phone numbers and flirting mm -hmm. because they, hey, their wife wasn't here, there, mm -hmm. so they went for it. I wasn't happy there. And, and many times uh, the guys in the band would get caught. Yeah. It was no fun then. It was no mm -hmm. fun then when they get caught and, mm -hmm. and uh, lives were damaged. And mm -hmm. It was a sad time for me. Marriages just, were ruined. Yeah. So. Sad. But when we got saved, when we got righteously saved, yeah. man, we did our best. Did, did we follow the Bible for the first day? Of course no. not. We had to learn. We had to grow. We made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but we had joy. Sometimes that joy would fade, and sometimes we would do stuff and get ourselves all angry again. But the reality is, <clears throat> obeying God's word, there's joy. Mm -hmm. Obeying the law, there's joy. Amen. Number uh, Verse 19. Words alone will not discipline a servant. <clears throat> the words may be understood, but they are not heeded. What does that mean? That what is that? That sounds a little confusing. It's not confusing at all. Here, here it is. If you know what to do and don't do it, that's sin. So, it, words alone, just being being corrected alone, uh, you've got to take action to the words that you read in the Bible. You've got to take the words that you read in the Bible, or in a message, or in a lesson like tonight. You've got to take them seriously, and you've got to put them into action. It's funny. A lot of people feel that, well, let me let me clarify. I'm going to say something, and I don't want to upset anybody. I'm not trying to offend you or anything. But the reality is this. Some people go to church thinking all they have to do is go to church, and everything's going to be fine. Yes, you need to go to church. Yes, you need to hear Bible studies like this on Facebook. But you also got to take that word to heart and do what it says. It's not good enough just to hear the words alone. You've got to discipline yourself to obey the word and do what the word calls you to do. The words may be understood, but they are not heeded. So don't don't get all upset. Well, I went to the Bible. I went to I read the Bible and I went to church and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Let me help you. It don't work unless you work it. Uh, I think TD Jake said that. It don't work unless you work it. You've got to put the word of God into action. You've got to work the word. You've got to do the word. It's not enough merely just to hear the word. You know what the Bible says in James? If you hear the word and don't do it, you're deceiving yourself. In other words, you ain't fooling nobody but yourself. Wow, that's some heavy stuff. What about the baby Christian that I've heard so many times from baby Christians that 
they, they get the King James version of the Bible, which is the hardest to me. And they said, I tried the Bible and I didn't understand it, so I quit reading it. Yeah, that's that's a cop out. Yeah. It, when anybody see, here's the thing: if you say I'm going to read the Bible, and if you take a moment and say, "Lord, help me to understand Your Word," the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit's going to make it clear to you. And if you have to be open to receive, but if you really don't want to learn, if you don't really want to change, then yeah. You're 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 not going to change. It doesn't matter how much you read the Bible. You've got to do the Bible. And as far as the King James version, there are so many different translations now. I want to encourage you. Uh, most of the time, I read out of the NIV, but a lot, a lot of times lately, I've been using the New Living Translation, only because I like the the English, the way it's phrased. It makes it easier to to understand and and some and and you know I'm not. And it doesn't, it's not dumbing down the gospel. It's just making it easier to understand. And there's, and I, when I study, I will use several different translations. In fact, in, even in my messages, it'll have a, the new King James. We just, I used the new King James recently. And then I use the NIV a lot. And I use the New Living Translation. But I, knew, I use one also called the New Century Version. Because this is what happens. God will speak to me, and he will give me a word, and then I'll look at the translations, and I find the word he's already given to me in a different translation, so I'll use that one. It is really pretty cool. It's really pretty cool the, the way that's working out. But the important thing is get the word into you and do what it says. Absolutely. Amen. Here's the one. This is really pretty interesting. Verse 20. There is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. You know, uh, well, a fool doesn't know what they're talking about because they're a fool. But what about the guy or the girl or the woman that uh, doesn't think before they speak? Let me help you. This is what I see in this verse. If you're not thinking, then you're probably listen. I'm going to get in your Kool-Aid. And if you don't like it, take it up with God. But when I don't think, when I speak without thinking, what do you think is motivating my, my speech? It's not the thought process. It's not the Bible. It's not me thinking about it. What is it? It's my emotions. When you're not thinking, you're speaking from your emotions. You're speaking from your anger, or you're speaking from your embarrassment, or you're speaking from... Uh, your disappointment or whatever it may be, but you're speaking from your emotions. That's the problem. You Have you ever said anything to someone that you regretted and you said, I'm sorry, I really didn't mean that? Mm -hmm. Sure, we've all been there. We've all done that. But that's because we're not thinking. We're speaking. Now, every person that belongs to New Joy Church Knows Pastor David has to think in the middle of his messages. Mm -hmm. How many times have I started to say something and I stop and go, oh, can't say that. Mm -hmm. I can't say that right now. <laughs> Why? Because I get so involved in, in my message, so involved in the topic that sometimes my emotions begin to rise up above my thought process, even to the point of rising up above the Word of God. And, man, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure what I'm saying is spirit-inspired, spirit-led, so I think. And even if I have to catch myself in mid-sentence, I will stop. I will stop, and I will go back to what the Spirit is trying to tell me to say. You know, and that comes from way back. When I was a new believer, probably we were probably three or four years into the Lord. And this one guy was talking about um, the rapture. And he was talking about the second coming of Christ. He was talking about the rapture. And he said that he believed in, in premillennial. He believed in the rapture of the church before the, the thousand day reign. And, and uh, I'm not going to get into that. But the, the reason, and this is his reason, and he did it with a lot of emotion. 
He says, I believe that the church is going to go up before the great tribulation. That's what he said. And he said, you know why? Because I'm going to be on the first train to glory. <laughs> what? And when I heard that, and he said it with a lot of emotion, the church exploded. The church started cheering and praising God and excited. And I'm sitting there scratching my head. I'm just a new believer. I've just been three or four years in the Lord. And I'm going, what? Uh-uh. I'm never going to allow my emotions to supersede the word of God and stop the spirit from speaking to me. Now, those of you that are, oh, this is coming from the spirit. Don't get mad at me. Those of you, and I hope you realize who you are, many of you are on a, are on a spiritual roller coaster. You're on an emotional roller coaster. You get on that emotional roller coaster, and I guarantee you that roller coaster will take your spirit places that you don't want it to go. They'll, that'll take your mind and your thoughts and your attitudes in places you don't want to go. Don't get on that emotional roller coaster. Get on the Word of God. Get on what the Bible is saying so you don't lose control and let your thought processes go way outside of, of truth. Your emotions, let me tell you something. Your emotions will lie to you. Absolutely. In fact, they lie to you quite a bit. So don't listen to the emotions. Listen first and foremost to the Word of God and the Spirit of God and then when your emotions get off track, the Spirit will say what the Spirit says to me. Slow your roll, David. Let's get back on track. Amen? Yeah, what about the person that that speaks by their emotions but have convinced themselves that this is spirit-filled? Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, I See, that's, that's, that's really hard. Because there are a lot of people that do that. Even pastors speak from their emotions and say some things that really are not are not biblical, not accurate. So, man, I don't know what to say to that. Other than if they would go back to the Word, check everything you say back to the by the Word of God, then you'll see when you when you speak out of turn. So, I hope that you're open to the Spirit. And I hope you go back and reevaluate and take a good look at what you're saying. Now, for me, it was easy because everything I say in a, in a message is recorded. So what I would do, especially when I first started preaching, I would preach my heart out. I would study hard. And then the next week, I would go back and I would listen to the message to see where I messed up, see where I maybe had misquoted scripture and one time, one time only, I really, really misrepresented uh, the word, the passage that I was preaching on. So the next Sunday, I got up and said, remember when I said this? I need to apologize to you all. I spoke out of place. That's not what the word of God means. And only once did I have to stop and, and uh, go back and tell the folks the next Sunday, I'm sorry, I misquoted scripture and I... I do my best never to do that. So I guess another good way would be is to ask someone to be hold, to hold you accountable. Be willing and open to, to someone else. Say, you know what? What do you think about this? What do you think what I said about that? You know, you. but I'm concerned that people that live off, off their emotions will not be open uh, yeah to correction in the spirit so that's that's a tough one i hope that if that's if well i don't even want that's it i'm done i'm gonna go on something else so we're going on now we're going to go on now to verse 21 oh parents i gotta get in your kool-aid tonight a servant pampered from childhood will become a rebel a servant pampered from childhood if you start, come on now, parents. Come on, grandparents. Oh, Y'all spoil your kids so much, and then you wonder why they're so rebellious. 
you spoil them you don't let you don't let them be held accountable for their actions and you try to protect them and you try to cover them and all you got is a spoiled brat that doesn't want to listen to you oh I, I don't know that's I believe there's someone watching that and this, and I'm describing you and you don't like it and you're getting mad but I'm sorry it's true you've got to discipline your children Discipline is a form of love. You've got to correct them. You don't just pamper them. And and once, yes, of course, if they're small, you do the things that you need to do to take care of them. But when they're getting older, they need to be held responsible. You know, if you've got a, <laughs> if you've got an 18 year old living in your home and you still make their bed, mom, come on, make them clean their own room. They're, they're good enough. Are they helping in the house? Are they taking out the garbage? Are they doing chores? Whatever. You know what I'm saying? But you're hurting your own child when you overly spoil them. When you constantly spoil your child, you're actually hurting them. And you're teaching them to be rebellious. That they don't they can do what they want and have no consequences. Huh. Are we seeing that in today's society? You better believe it. You will get something? I just remember when we were baby Christians and I wanted to do something. And of course, they put me in the classroom. And I remember a child that was really out of control. And I remember talking to the teacher that I was going to take over. And you know, she told me, she goes, Oh, that's the pastor's kid. They're, they're the worst ones. I just thought that was so sad. Yeah. That yeah. And I says, really? And she goes, yeah, because they, they give attention to everyone else, and the kids, bad attention is no attention at all. Well, that's that's yeah. different than what that verse is talking oh, about. Is it? Oh, that's okay. talking about spoiling somebody uh -huh. and, and not holding them responsible. That's different because, uh, unfortunately, pastors, you know, and, I, and I, told, I told Michelle that if I ever did these types of things, I would leave the ministry, mm -hmm. but uh, neglect. Now, I've heard pastors say, well, I'm taking care of the pastors. I'm taking care of the church, and God will take care of my children. Nah, man. Uh -uh. You take care of the church. Your wife is part of the church. Your children are part of the church. You love them and take care of them and nurture them. You don't spoil them. Now, this verse is not talking about neglect. This is talking about spoiled, spoiled kids. So, Grandma... Feel convicted yet? Am I supposed to? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're supposed to. Uh, yes, we're guilty. Uh, we, but I've, I, you know what? I, I spank my grandchildren. Yes, he does. I correct my grandchildren. Mm. Uh, Michelle don't, but that's another story. <laughs> we can get into that. We ain't calling out names. So a servant, a servant. You just did. <laughs> Thank you very much. A servant pampered from childhood will become a rebel. Verse twenty-two. Oh, man, an angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. An angry person starts fights. If you're constantly angry and bitter, and you, yeah, you'll fight with anybody. You'll start, you're just, and you think you're justified in the fights. No, but here's the problem with that. It's more than just fighting with someone. It's more than just arguing with someone. You know what it is? That hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sins. It's not just the fight. It's mm -hmm. the other thing. It's passing on. Listen, parents, you can pass on bitterness to your children. You can pass on resentment to your children. You can mm -hmm. pass on judge a judgmental attitude to your children. You can pass on prejudice to your children and what you want to be passing on to your children is the word of god what you want to be passing on to your children is love for god so loved the world god is love man let's learn to love and, and not this mushy wushy kind of love where we overlook everybody's faults we yeah. speak the truth in love the best thing you can do is be honest with your with yourself and honest with your children, even your grandchildren, your friends, that, man, why are you always angry? Why are you always mad? We need You need to deal with that. That hot-tempered person is going to do all sorts of things 
that are going to hurt not only themselves, but, but actually will hurt the ones that are closest to them, the ones they say they love, the ones they say they protect. But we pass on prejudice and anger. We pass on bitterness. And that's, man, I'm praying that that stops. If you're angry, find out why. Maybe, maybe you need spiritual counseling. Maybe you need to meet with a Christian counselor mm -hmm. to help you to understand why you're so angry and why things bother you so much. Because it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not. You got one on that? I just say it's a process when you do go and get help. You know, um, don't give up because things aren't changing. You have to allow the spirit to work inside you. And, you know, you didn't get to this point overnight. So why do we expect uh, a change right away when it yeah. took years to get us where we're at? Yeah, okay. Amen, amen. Um, one last thing on that. Um, you need to forgive yourself. Yes. A lot of people, especially Christians, a lot of Christians are angry with themselves, and they have a lot of trouble forgiving themselves. Listen, if God forgives you, why don't you forgive yeah, you? He's already forgiven you, and you've asked for forgiveness. And then what you do is you actually nullify God's forgiveness because you refuse to forgive yourself. That's scripture. There's scripture to that. So anyway, I, um, I really want to encourage you to deal with why you're so angry. And if you need to get someone involved in your life, uh, a, spirit, a mentor or a spiritual counselor, a, a, a Christian counselor, a pastor, whoever, get, get the help you need. Amen. 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 So let's keep on going. We're going good. Here's verse 23. Pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. Pride ends in humiliation. Yeah, those prideful people, sooner or later, people figure out how they are, what, what, they're, what they're about, and, and they, they do things that humiliate, humiliate themselves, which is crazy. So, but if you learn to be humble, that will bring honor into your life. You know, some one of the most humbling things that many of you will have to do, it and it's but it's not that it's not that hard to explain. So I'm gonna explain it to you. One of the most important things for a person that's very prideful, what you need to learn to do is to stop talking. <laughs> stop the words you're saying. Stop let someone else talk. Let someone else share their lives uh, humble yourselves by stop um putting attention to yourself you know sometimes let someone else speak in, into your life or you know don't always you don't always have to have the answers mm -hmm. you don't you don't always have to and um well you got anything on that i i was just thinking about well, what about that person that that Thinks that they got it all together. I mean, uh, they think that they have to keep talking because they have so much to give, but yet they won't look within deep within themselves yeah. that they have a problem. Yeah, they do. And if you're not open to letting people speak into your life, yeah, then you'll keep talking, and people will still will look at you and think, "Man, what's wrong with it?" Yeah. She's got a rebellious spirit. Yeah. Or, or him. Because the guys, yeah. Yeah, oh, guys yeah. have this problem too. Me and she. Sister. But yeah, you, you deal with the sisters, I'll deal with the dudes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, verse verse 24. Because we're almost, with, we got a uh, couple more verses to go and we'll be done. If you assist the thief, you only hurt yourselves. You are sworn to tell the truth, but you dare not testify. Man, oh man, that's and we're getting in your Kool-Aid tonight. Here we go. If you assist a thief, if you cover for someone that's lying, why are you saying lying? Well, let's say you've got a coworker that can't seem to get on time at work and and you're covering for that coworker. What you're doing is you're helping that coworker steal time, steal money. 
Because if that person was supposed to be uh, at work at 8.30, and they to work till 9.30, and then you're covering for them, or you know, where are they? Or have you seen them? Go, yeah, they're here somewhere. You just have that person steal $15 an hour, whatever. What if you're making $30 an hour? Whatever you're making, you're helping a thief. And you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught helping when you assist someone else who's stealing. Either stealing time or stealing money or, or stealing, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, stealing reputation. That's the word I'm thinking. What do I mean by stealing reputation? Let's say okay. Let's let's use Michelle. Michelle is mad at somebody. Michelle don't like this uh, brother so and so. So she comes up to me and she starts saying, "Well, you know that though, no good, dirty guy." And blah 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 blah. And I'm, and I'm just sitting there t listening to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, honey. Uh huh. So that so what you do is when you criticize and complain and talk down about people, you're stealing their reputation. You don't know what they're going through. Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they had a struggle in their lives, and, and all you do is criticize it. I think that's, this is just my own opinion, my own feeling. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this is one of the biggest ways Christians steal. You're stealing someone's reputation when you gossip when you criticize and when you complain and if you get into that mode you're only hurting yourself but we're not looking at, at you know that as being uh, we're stealing that we're looking at it as oh it's okay I mean, oh, okay i feel like cover for my friend you know yeah. we don't look at it as of course really you don't is. that's why i have to say it because you ain't thinking about it. You're just trying to help a buddy. You're trying to help a friend. But let me tell you, you're not helping your friend. Yeah, yeah, if you're helping them to steal time from work or, yeah. or if you're helping them by oh, the, listening to all their complaints and listening to all their criticism, mm -hmm. what if their criticism is valid? Yeah. It's still criticism. It's still putting someone down. It's still causing trouble. It's still not right even if it's justified so li listen to the in, but look at the next part uh, this this may get you even more you are sworn to tell the truth but you dare not testify you know ho withholding the truth you know not saying what you need to say not being honest with friends but just well i didn't tell them a lie i just didn't tell them nothing i wish that was okay because then i would do it but you've got to be honest, you know. So if someone comes up to you, maybe they got mad and then and, and, and they were upset about something, and then they go and say, "Well, what do you think? Do you think I was wrong?" And you say, "I don't know." You know they were wrong, but you say, "I don't know." That doesn't help. You're not testifying. You're sworn to tell the truth. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're a follower in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the truth will set you free. But when you withhold truth, you're withholding the truth. And you're lying because you're not telling what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. That's hard. Oh, and, well. And we have to do what the Bible says. We don't, but we don't deal with our emotions or feelings. We don't want to hurt their feelings if we tell them the truth. They won't like me as a friend. They won't, you know. We have so many excuses yeah. not, to, not to do what the Bible says. Listen, if, if telling someone the truth, if you lose their friendship because you told them the truth, they weren't your friend to begin with. Yeah, that's right. That you want someone, the Bible even speaks of uh, that the wounds of a friend are helpful. Sometimes you got to tell your friend the truth. Sometimes you got to go straight up, man. That ain't right, bro. That ain't right, sister. Mm -hmm. Tell them because you're helping them. Wound them if you have to because they're going to be better because of it. Mm -hmm. But if we keep covering up for people and if we keep saying, no, oh, no, 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 you, you didn't do nothing wrong. They did it to you. You're not helping them. Mm -hmm. We've got to tell the truth. 
to speak the truth in love and are on a, on a constant basis. Mm-hmm. Right, Sister Michelle? Yeah, because if they don't like it and they quit talking to you, you know that they're, they're only thinking about themselves, their own feelings. And That's it. Licking their own wounds because yeah. they, they really wasn't your friend to start off with. Yeah. yeah. They if if they person. yeah if they if they cut you off because you tell them the truth, yeah. then they weren't your friends. No, they they were probably uh, there to try to use you to get something from you to make themselves feel better, yeah. and and that's not healthy. We're supposed to be investing in other people's lives to help them. Mm-hmm. See, this is how it works. You help me, I help Michelle. Michelle helps you. We all get help. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. But but if we try to cover up for people we're not helping them at all so you'll probably be better off without their friendship all right verse 25 oh this is a good one for this for this time too fearing people is a dangerous trap but trusting the lord means safety fearing people now here you know when i first got into the pastoral ministry when i first started hanging going to pastor meetings and and going to the city functions that were for pastors and leaders i saw something that was very disturbing it really really bothered me i saw men of god pastors that were afraid of their people and that were doing things that were just a little skewed off, a little off uh, from from the word of god because people were were controlling I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, I've, I've seen some real mean people in church and in, in board meetings, not our board meetings. Our board meetings are cool, but um, you can't be afraid. Brother, you can't be afraid. Sister, you can't be afraid. That fear is, is the only one you're supposed to fear is fear God, not fear man. Man, so we've got to stop being afraid of people fearing people is a dangerous trap you know and it, it can really get you messed up and fear and intimidation is one of the one of the tricks the enemy uses on a regular basis trying to get the church afraid trying to get believers and christians afraid and and fear is an epidemic in our nation right now people are so 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 afraid and it's it's uh, it's not healthy, it it's very harmful. But here's the thing: if you trust the Lord, you got nothing to be afraid of. Amen. You've got nothing to be afraid of. If you're trusting the Lord, He's got your back. He's covering you. But Jesus put it this way: Don't be afraid of people who can kill you, and that's all they can do. You need to be afraid of the one who can kill you, then send you to hell. In other words, you need to be afraid of God. We need a healthy fear of God, a reverence for God, but also a fear of God. And if we're not fearing God and we're fearing people, but we're not overly concerned about violating Scripture because someone is telling us to violate Scripture. You know, I remember one guy, we're in this meeting, and he was so afraid of his church that he thought that they, he was afraid, if I don't do what they say, they're going to fire me. <laughs> Guess what? They fired him anyway. But that's I'm not going to get into that subject because that's a whole different subject right there. You know, you men, you need to be called of God. And if you're called of God to pastor a church, you pastor that church according to what the Bible says, not according to what some board says. Because Besides that, if you do what God says, if you're following the word, you will have favor with God and with man. That's how I run my ministry. I've got favor with God and favor with man. So, so. Bottom line, trusting in the Lord means you're safe. All right? So we got two more verses, and then we're going to call it an evening, and we'll be finished with this next week. We'll do uh, something brand new. I'm thinking of uh, some ideas for next week to do something different. But verse 26, many seek the ruler's favor, but justice comes from the Lord. Oh, man. Many seek the ruler's favor. Now, does that apply to churches today? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, and there's a big controversy. There's a big argument at some time. Sometimes there's an, an argument about, you know, well, you know, it's we're fighting for our rights and, and we need to stay open as a church because um, the government has, 
has closed us down and won't let us meet. And then there's other pastors saying, you know, they're not going to stop us. We can just go online and we can share through video. You know, we, we're going to obey what the government says because that's what the Bible says. There's so many different viewpoints and different ways of doing it and different ways of fighting about it. But here's the thing. Bottom line is the Bible said it's we are to obey God rather than man. Yeah. So if the government or anybody else wants you to do something that violates Scripture, you don't do it. You stand firm and say, God's going to protect me. I'm going to do what God has, has instructed us to do. Many seek the ruler's favor, but justice comes from the Lord. The Lord's going to make it right. The Lord's going to make it right. If, if, as long as you do what God says, as long as you obey the word of God, you're, you're going to be fine. And you don't need to be afraid. Uh, so, so those pastors that decided to, to keep their churches open, you know what? We don't need to be afraid. We don't. Here, listen. If, if I decide to keep New Joy Church open during this time where we're not supposed to meet, and someone comes in from the state and arrests me, Oh, well, God is going to protect me. God's got me. There's a whole lot of worse things that could happen than that. So then you may have a question. Pastor David, are you guys open? Listen, this is what the Lord said. I was. We are doing live stream services, but if someone comes to New Joy Church needing to be with other believers, I'm not going to say, you come to church, you want to worship God in my church? How am I going to turn you away? I, the Lord asked me, are you going to turn them away, David? No, I'm not. I'm not going to turn them away. So technically we're still open. Uh, if I get a fine, I get a fine. But what I'm getting is the presence of God. And what I'm getting is grateful people, thankful, that they have a place to worship with other believers. We're not packed out. We're social distancing. You know, we're getting maybe about 20 folk. But I'm not going to stop. And I believe that, uh, and because we got some good news Monday, so they're starting to talk about rolling back some of these restrictions again. Uh, they're not ready to do it. But I, I believe that in, in the very near future, we're going to be able to go back to, to uh, social distance. Um, services. I think that's that's. I think that'll happen again within the next couple of weeks. But if it doesn't, we're going to say, watch us online. You don't have to come in. I'm not forcing anybody to come into the building. I'm not putting any guilt trips. Stay home. Stay safe. Every you know, we wear masks at church. You know, of course, the worship team can't sing, so we don't wear a mask when we're singing. We're singing, but uh, all that stuff. We're doing our best to stay safe. We are live streaming our service on Facebook, and then we'll repost it on YouTube. But if you, Family Joy folk, if you want to be with us in the presence of the Lord and, and together worshiping God, come. I cannot and will never refuse to let anyone come to church to worship together. So... Fearing people, yeah. Verse twenty six. Many seek the rule. Oh, we just did that, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the okay. Well, I'm gonna have to really fix this up. All right. The last verse for tonight is this: the righteous despise the unjust, the wicked despise the godly. You know, I just listened to a message by Tony Evans, a powerful, powerful message, and one of the things he said was. If you stand up for Christianity, there's some people that are going to reject you. And uh, so that's the bottom line. That's true. You know, the righteous despise the unjust. The wicked despise the godly. Because we're going to do what the Bible says and we're going to be godly. There are going to be some people that, that are not going to like it. And they will disagree with us and, and criticize us. All right, and the last verse we want to cover is the verse 27. The righteous despise the unjust, the wicked despise the godly. 
when you want to do what's right, when you want to follow God, when you there are always going to be people that are not going to agree with you. And there are always going to be people that re, re, will reject you or, or won't want to be uh, in your life anymore. And they'll want, they don't want to have anything to do, do with you. And, and I get that. Uh, the wicked despise the godly. So they'll, they'll turn away from us. But the thing is, for us, we need to be careful. If we're trying to serve God, we need to be careful with our dealings with unjust people. People that are not interested in doing what's right, not interested in justice, not interested in, but only interested in doing what they want to do and get theirs. We need to be open and honest enough with ourselves to say, maybe I need to, tur- I, maybe I need to cut that that friend loose. Maybe I shouldn't be hanging around with that person because they're actually doing harm and not good. So, so it it's both ways. It's both ways. We. And it's not that we're arrogant, and it's not that we're judgmental. It's that we're trying to keep safe. You know that social distancing. Some, some of y'all listen. Uh, I'm not. You maybe you're doing social distancing, and that's good. But some of y'all need to do some spiritual distancing. Oh, come on! That was an amen right there, Sister amen. Michelle. That was good stuff right there. <laughs> yeah, you need to do some spiritual distancing and get away from these people that are that are pulling you down that are not really concerned about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they're more concerned with hurting people and more concerned with pulling people down and more concerned with getting theirs. But because the wicked, they're always going to, they're they're not going to come. They're they're always going to reject us until they need prayer. Isn't that funny? Those wicked people, they reject you until they need prayer. Then all of a sudden you're their best friend. But what do you do when someone comes up to you that's always rejected you then asks for prayer? What do you do? You pray. You take. You make the most of every opportunity. You lay hands on them. You pray for them. You call. You ask God to fill them with His love. God reach them and save them. Pray for them when they come. The sad reality is a lot of times they'll never come. But in the meantime, we're going to love them and share the gospel. But we're not going to let them influence us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, honey, we're done with this chapter, and we're going to be doing something different next week. And uh, so thank you so much for for being here and giving us your wisdom and asking some really good questions and looking so pretty. (laughs) Yes, I'm in love. I'm in love. So anyway, you got one last thing you want to say? No, I, I know you told me to look at it. It this morning, and I was being a mark for trying to do anything, but uh, it was a good lesson, good lesson. Well, thank you. Heart, and <laughs> to really allow the Spirit to really uh, put it in your heart. Um, I, th- I want to challenge the people out there to read to read that uh, that chapter, because it is loaded with so much things. That could really help you walk walking with the Lord. Yeah, Amen. Quit blaming everybody else for <laughs> what you're going through. Yeah. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this time and your Word. Thank you for the so much uh, to learn from Proverbs 29. Uh, may those that have followed along uh, be be continually be blessed and encouraged by your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 So I'm in a series on Sunday uh, looking at um, a lot of different aspects of God. So I, I hope you can watch us online on Sunday at 10 a.m. And we are at 980 Gettysburg Avenue in Clovis, New Joy Church. So God bless you all and good night. Peace. <laughs>